great to be here. Um, so first of all, my name is Donna, and I am a compulsive serial entrepreneur. I have started a number of different organizations and now seemingly an energy company. Um, and I had this incredible summer. I spent six weeks at something called the Unreasonable Institute in Boulder, Colorado. And it was six of the most amazing weeks of my life. And then I had this five-week cancer scare, which was highly shocking to my system, the most disruptive experience I've ever had. And it got me thinking, I don't have cancer, it got me thinking that um, the world collapsed, the economy, Wall Street, the financial recessions, the mess that we're in economically, kind of like a cancer, kind of like a global catastrophic flashpoint. And so, just like my scare made me take stock, made me want to reinvent my life, except that I really liked my life, which was the good news. I really love what I do. I have this fabulous family. But the world economy is not in that state. The world economy needed to be shaken up. The world economy needed to falter because it's built on a whole bunch of lies and artificial premises and concentrating wealth into too few people's pockets. And so we find ourselves at this flashpoint, this moment in time where we can do really big things because the status quo has been interrupted. It's been disrupted. There's this invitation to all of us to do really big things, just like I've never felt more hungry to do really big things, I think we can all use this moment in time to step up. And I read two books while I was in my downswing, while I was scared that I wouldn't be here in a year. And the two books were Paul Hawkins' Blessed Unrest. Anybody in the audience read Blessed Unrest? It's an amazing, amazing book. Um, it tells the story of the world's largest movement in human history that nobody sees, all of us and billions of other people all over the world. And it basically calls us to do three things. The three things are reinvent our relationship to indigenous wisdom, figure out how to know what cultures that have been around for 10,000 years know about how to live in balance and respect. The second thing, it calls our attention to global poverty and the absolute moral failing of our time is this incredible gap between rich and poor. And so we have to take that on. And lastly, climate change. We have to stop climate change. And we don't have to agree politically. We don't have to agree left, right, green. We don't have to agree on who we elect. We don't have to agree on what policies we need to enact. We need to agree that we are going to take on the moral challenges of our time head on. Other generations took on slavery. Other generations took on bringing the vote to women. So we can do these big things. The American economy fundamentally retooled itself during World War II and took auto body plants and turned them into places to build planes. 300,000 planes in no time at all because it had the will. The United States took people to the moon because you had the will. So, we're at this point in time where we need to decide about whether we're going to stand up and take responsibility for these big, big issues. And I want to start a little bit by taking us on a tour around the world, but I want to start a little further out. The sun. For me, the sun is the only nuclear technology in the universe that is safe. It is 93 million miles away. It is awesomely powerful. In fact, the sun is so powerful that in one hour, it sends enough energy to the Earth to power the entire globe for a year. So what are we doing? Why aren't we harnessing better? Why aren't we gathering better? Why aren't we accepting what First Nations, what Native Americans called the gifts of the Creator, and turning that into a way to power our economy? Because we have to do it as a globe. We have to all be able to power ourselves. We have to all be able to live. We have to all be able to send our children to school. And so I'm here to talk about my personal commitment and my belief that the entire world can move to an energy portfolio that is 100% renewable. And that the best scientists and the best academics, the best people that have been really working on this for decades, 
They're telling us that we can do this. The really ambitious ones are saying 2020. The cautious ones, Stanford University academics, saying 2030. Off-the-shelf technology, nothing new invented, no big tech breakthrough, right now, stuff you can buy, that we can do this by 2030. And then the conservatives are saying 2050. So let's argue about how fast. Let's not argue about weather. <laughs> Let's get to work on moving to 100% renewable energy portfolio. Because here's where we are. And the first big, ugly picture I want you to look at is the brown, ruined landscape, which is from my lovely country. It's the Alberta tar sands, so-called ethical oil that's being sold um, in many people's minds to your country as the primary market. Um, Nuclear power, for me, is not an option. And coal, well, we know the price of coal, and it's not even really employing people anymore. But our energy has become such a moral crisis that the greatest leaders of our time, Bishop Desmond Tutu, the Dalai Lama, countless Nobel laureates have all come together and said, Canada, US, stop in your tracks. The tar sands are a disaster, and we have to move to clean energy. And so here's a quick one-minute video made by some friends of mine that unpack some of the mythology of what my country is calling ethical oil. And so we could have a really different energy portfolio, which is the real purpose of why I'm here today. We need to take this massive leap of faith. We need to um, build different infrastructure. I think we can build incredible energy projects um, that demonstrate new technology, that use off the shelf, that pull people together, that lay communities' hands on the technology. And that's some of the projects that I'm going to talk about. I think that our, our incredible um, impoverishment, both in North America, Europe, in continents like Africa, the jobs issue is about creating good green jobs. The job issue is about putting people back to work. And so again, we don't have to disagree, we don't have to squabble about how to do it. But renewable energy is clearly one of the new drivers, that solar and wind are already outpacing dirty forms of energy right now. And so there's incredible opportunities to put people back to work. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of places around the world that aren't talking about energy, that aren't talking about 25% or 50, that have actually landed 100% renewable energy infrastructure. Iceland. Anybody in the room know that Iceland is run on 100% renewable energy right now? 100% geothermal. They only import gasoline for automobiles. Otherwise, it runs all their heat, light, and power. Scotland has committed to being, as a country, 100% renewable by 2020, inspired by this tiny little island in the Hebrides, these uppity anarchist Scots. They just bought themselves an island. And they said to the government of Scotland, hold it, we don't want diesel generators. Keep all of your power distribution mechanisms. We're going to go 100% renewables. And they were the first place to do it. And they built a tourism economy. They have eco-energy tourism from all over the world coming to see a place fueled by clean and green energy. They have solar, they have micro-hydro, they have wind power, but they've built this fabric and this culture that actually informs all of their job creation strategies, all of their economic development is filtered through being this green place. And this is my favorite place on the planet, the traditional territory of the Hashquit Nation. 
It's an incredibly deep culture, 10,000 years old. The elders can show you the cave where every single ancestor, where their bodies lie. Um, they're the world's greatest car uh, totem pole carvers, and they're probably some of the best storytellers I've ever met. The most articulate people I know on this planet come from this nation. We've built a project with this community where we're actually what I call culturally modifying the technology. So when the project started, we asked the elders, what's sacred, what's essential, who are you, what do you love, what do you know from your ancestors about how to live in this place? And then those ideas and those values and their aesthetic traditions got woven into the project. So all of a sudden, solar panels get marked with the culture. And wind towers look like totem poles instead of conventional towers, so that the entire community and the entire culture shows up in the technology. And so I think there's incredible opportunity around the world to marry the depth of culture with green technology in ways that transforms projects. The soul of this project is different because the culture is present. But we've also built together a platform of renewable energy that is unleashing entrepreneurship. So there's entrepreneurs in this community that have never started anything in their lives, who are starting food businesses. There's carvers that are moving into making tables and furniture. There's opportunities, again, around tourism. And then there's jobs tied to the energy. So there's this incredible potential inside these communities that have been left out of the economy by the creative power of renewable energy. And then the left out list for me um, is big. It's not just indigenous people that have been left out. I would argue that in many ways, women have been left out. And there's this great brain science right now that's really looking at the differences between men and women's brains. That men's brains are wired and have more gray matter. Guys, you have bigger brains and you have more gray matter. Hold on to that. <laughs> so that means you're really good at linearity. You're really good at bagging and chasing and going after that one thing in the short term and staying focused on that one thing. Because your brains developed to bag that big old mastodon and drag it back. <laughs> Women's brains, other, more white matter, more interconnective tissue, more context, more longer range thinking. Women's vision is actually even wider in focus than men's vision. And we've left women out. And I'm not saying that there's not a role for smarty pants, middle class white guys to reinvent the world. We want that. But it's not all the world needs right now. So we need more women. We also need more artists. I don't think the lawyers and the engineers and the bean counters are going to get us out of the messes we're in. I think we need people who know how to step out of boxes, who have actually never even stepped onto a box. They don't need to blow up the box because they've been working in circles. They've been working in a parallel creative context. And we need that kind of intelligence right now. We need the bottom of the pyramid. We need the homeless. We need dumpster divers. We need people that have been incarcerated. We need incredible creative intelligence from the margins to come into the mainstream in order to solve the problems that we're facing right now. And we need our capital. We need people-powered capital. We need to crowdsource solutions. We need to unlock our assets. What are our credit cards? What are our mortgages? What are our investments? What are our pensions doing right now in terms of reinventing the world's relationship to energy? Recently, I think the world lost an incredible leader. When Gary Mathai has been an inspiration for me for many years, she's inspired people all over the globe, was the founder of the Greenbelt Movement in Kenya. But she told this one really amazing story about a hummingbird, and it just goes like this. There was a big fire, and all the other animals were transfixed. They came out, and they stood watching, and they felt powerless, and their eyes were glazed over, and they couldn't move because they were so locked on to their powerlessness. And the hummingbird decided, well, I can't just watch. This forest is sacred. This is my home. This is everything I know. This is where my children and their children will live or not. And so the hummingbird started to go for drops of water, racing to drop it on the fire, back to the river, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, in a dizzying pace, and the other animals finally stopped her and said, what are you doing? You can't affect this. You can't stop this. Your tiny little droplets of water are absolutely meaningless. 
And the hummingbird paused and said, I am small, there's very little that I can do, you're right, but I'm doing the best that I can. And that was when Gary Mathai's challenge to all of us, that she was doing with her whole life the best that she could, and she asked all of us around the world to just remember what we love and bring it and use it to change the world, because that is the only thing that ever has changed the world. Thank you. Thank you.